All righty. Um, for those of you who, like me, just now read the schedule, uh, will see that I actually now own this stage for an hour and a half. And the formal agenda says Ansible, Market Landscape, Outlook, NSO Roadmap. Uh, so I took that and I transformed this into the, uh, the following agenda. Um, so I'm going to do a round of introductions of myself and my team. I think almost, if not all of them, are here. Um, we're going to talk about NSO and Ansible and some of the stuff that we've done together with the Red Hat Ansible networking team. I'm going to hand over to one of my colleagues, Victor, to talk about some of the efforts that we're putting into, let's call it NSO ergonomics, or the usability of NSO. Perhaps not so much things that we put on the roadmap or put in the technical domain, but what we're doing to make it more easy to use. We have um, actually Cisco's representative in ONAP, and I'm, I'm going to ask you eventually to raise your hands if you know what ONAP is, otherwise you will, oh, there you go, a couple of hands already coming up. Cisco's actually uh, re actual representative in the ONAP project is here. He will give you an overview of ONAP, how it's going, and how NSO fits into that. And then, back to me, I'm going to walk through the roadmap that we have, and this is hopefully the interactive part of these 90 minutes, because obviously this is your unfiltered opportunity to actually influence what's on the roadmap. And we're going to briefly talk about some of the bigger ticket items um, that we see uh, going forward. And I hope we have some who's, uh, someone who's on their toes with the mic, so, or you just have a screen, because I hope that if you have any questions throughout these 90 minutes, just raise your hands and ask. Try to make this as interactive as we can. OK, then, so let's start. So my name is Carl Moberg. I am, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about terminology inside of Cisco. I am what's called the engineering product manager. So that tells you that there's, there's something else. There's some other product managers, too, and you would be right. There's also marketing product managers. So inside of uh, Cisco, around our part of the organization, we've split the product management team into two, two sides. The marketing PLMs take care of most of the outgoing as the, as the name would have it, all the marketing, all everything around what we call business operations, meaning price lists, packaging, um, bundles, all that kind of stuff. What we do on the engineering side is that we are the, what's called the inbound product managers, meaning that we spend time with customers. Uh, we try to explain, using the marketing side, what NSO actually is, so we own what's called the technical value proposition. And most importantly for me, I run the technical strategy, and that comes in the form of the roadmap. So I sit very closely with the engineering team, with the TLF engineering team. And you should think of me as the loading dock for incoming ideas. I am the arm to twist uh, to make software do what you need. That's what I get paid to do. And I have a small team. Um, first on the list here is Nils Petter. Nils, are you here? Is Nils here? Anyone seen Nils this morning? Okay. No, I can't see him. Nils runs the actual detailed planning for the NSO product. So we have more than NSO in our team. Nils also manages our relationship to our beloved partners. In his case, uh, he's the guy who runs the relationship with iTential and NetRounds. Both of them obviously are here. And again, any questions you may have around NSO, its future, and what we should be doing, that's his email. I could have put his mobile up there, but you know you probably have other means to find that. Mm. I think I saw KJ. KJ, you here? Everybody's just hiding outside. So KJ runs something called CFP. So CFP is actually a, a one of these beautiful acronyms. It's called Core Function Packs. Um, actually, if you remember, Colin mentioned that we are using NSO also for internal solutions. And one of the things that we do is that we develop something called Core Function Pack, which is value-added service packages that's developed and supported by Cisco Engineering. So he runs that part, and he also is responsible for what we call our Mano stack. So the integrated solution between the NS NSO NFVO and our VNF manager, ESE, who's run by, by Michael here. So he takes care of that packaging from an NFVO perspective. 
And then, of course, we have Niklas, our host for these three days. Hi, everyone. <laughs> he does the developer community. Of, of course, this event is a very, very important part of that. But he also runs the DevNet community and, and is in charge of that. And then we have Fredrik Svan, who is our product owner. So those of you who are in software development knows that that means that he is the gate to the actual engineering um, resources then. So that's the team. That's our contact information. Any questions around the engineering PL, uh, PLM side of things, please let us know. Please get in contact with us. And I can't resist also uh, making another plug for our DevNet portal. As NSO is maturing, we do profoundly realize that the actual experts around NSO is not at Svea Wegenschufem at our office. It's actually you guys. And the value creation around NSO, NSO now actually takes place between the experts. So we try to work very diligently, diligently in building a useful community, a place to go to learn and share. Lucky for us, Cisco has this DevNet framework, which is a very ambitious. If you've ever been to a, a, a bigger Cisco event, you've seen that we have all kinds of things focused around what we call DevNet. Because, of course, it's not only the, the, the uh, tail -F team that realizes that engineers interacting with each other and learning from each other is important. It is a profound theme around how Cisco interacts with the market now. So we leverage the DevNet framework. And we have an NSO part of that, of course. Um, we have a lot of learning um, news, so my PLM team is ever-present, try to keep everybody up to date with what's going. We have a public GitHub called the NSO Developer GitHub, uh, where people share code. Um, it's actually a, a, par a, a portal not only for you guys, but also, also for our own employees and for our partners. And we're trying to be diligent about helping with answering questions. It's not like an SLA-based support channel, but certainly a place that we monitor, also using our engineers. And we try to be quick with responses here. So I, you might have heard this until your ears fall off, but I would, I would like to once more remind you that please join us. Please look into this. And again, if you have any ideas or anything you want to share about this framework, get in touch with us. We are actually spending quite a bit of time trying to make sure that this is a useful resource. Can I just jump in with your comment there? Yes. So, uh, as you may have noticed, we are recording all the sessions in the, in the developer days here. We are posting them right here. So if you want to see something that you missed or see something again or look at the slides, this is the place to go. All this stuff that we are doing around and so is, it, this is the place to go. It's going to take a couple of weeks to do all the editing and get it up there, but it's, that's where it's coming. But we have already started uploading documents, right? Yeah, the slide presentations are up for a few of them, yes. But all the videos will be there, too. See, that's another reason for you guys to go visit DevNet as soon as you can. OK, so on to the actual formal agenda. So about a year and a half ago, and this is largely how big um, companies in the tech industry works, we started seeing that a couple of our customers were intensely interested in using Ansible for their network. Now, who here actually know what Ansible is? Raise a hand. Okay, that's good. I'm going to go with Colin's baseline, meaning that almost 100% of you guys know what it is. Uh, so about a year and a half ago, we started hearing about pretty widespread use of Ansible. And the way large companies react to those kinds of news is the sky is falling, right? Everything is now immediately going to go to Ansible, and we can give up on everything else, right? Which is never true about any technology change. What is true about technology change, though, is it's, it, it actually opens up for more interesting conversations. So what we did was that we actually contacted the Ansible networking team. Ansible is owned by Red Hat, and we started working together, because it turns out that they, too, of course, had heard about this thing called NSO. And what we wanted to do together was to come up with a way that made NSO and Ansible better than the constituent parts, a classic like 1 plus 1 is 3 kind of thing. And that actually came out quite nice. So we've actually had a, a, a couple of pieces of software and solutions on the market uh, since a couple of months. The way we thought about this is that we were both observing that when you talk to end users, they come out on either side of this fence. Right? On the left side, you have your application-centric people. They wake up and they think in application topologies, n-tier things. 
And they think that the network is just there to pass valuable data between the applications in the end tier setup. Some of them actually think the network is mostly in their way, and if they could take it out, they would, but they can't. Something needs to connect things. They tend to think in topologies, again, around applications. So if they use Ansible, they think in playbooks. And for them, obviously, the world can be defined by playbooks because applications are, is the lifeblood. What playbooks are not so good at is expressing and driving, it turns out, um, more powerful network services. So in the application-centric worldview, NSO sits below Ansible and abstracts or produces an interface with which to interact using Ansible. We actually have quite a bit of customers in the, in the SP space that think the other way around. They wake up and think about service chains. They wake up and, think up and think about MPLS VPNs or any kind of topology because they sell the actual interconnection. There may or may not be applications at the end, and they may or may not know that, but they make money. The actual value creation is in the network itself, not in the applications. They actually have another worldview, so they kind of like NSO's abstractions. They think in Yang models and graphs. What they also realize, though, is that there's something coming up. I you tend to call it loosely coupled networking functions. Um, one of the mistakes that we have, have made in the NFV world is that we think whenever a VM, or a container for that matter, is booted, it's ready to go. It turns out that in some of the emerging vendors and some of the emerging environments, that's not really true. When your VM comes up, you actually have to install things. You actually have to do application lifecycle management on the thing you just booted, right? So we have a couple of customers that use NSO to drive the networking service, and when needed, use Ansible to install the appropriate software on top of whatever it is that's, that's passing the packets. So you got the application-centric people, they think Ansible uh, or other things on top. You have the connectivity-centric people using Ansible to actually decorate or, or help, if you like, in the networking plane. Most of the action right now is, of course, on the left side. You know, most of the activities around Ansible, most of the traction that Ansible has is with the, uh, with the application people. So that's what we focused on for this presentation and most of the outward communication that we're doing. And this is how it works. Well, just real brief, right? Ansible is actually very much centered around something called playbooks. So a playbook is actually an ordered list of tasks. And tasks are named entries of things that get executed by the Ansible loop. Tasks have something called modules. A module can be the YUM package manager. It can be an SSH callout. It can be a whole lot of different things, right? And the tasks are then uh, executed until they're done, and you move on to the next, uh, you know, move on to the next task. So what we have here is a means for Ansible to use NSO modules. So we've written a couple of NSO modules. So you can hook these modules into your playbooks, and Ansible we will use the JSON RPC uh, northbound interface uh, to talk to NSO. Obviously based on all the good stuff on both sides, right? So, of course, this is uh, interacting directly with CDB. And the reason why we're using JSON RPC is actually because we can inline validate things. I'll talk about that in, in, in some more detail. But the idea here, then, is Ansible actually sees the network through NSO. And that's kind of the power of this, is you get a single point of entry into the network, your entire network, as you well know, um, using a very small set of modules. So the network for the Ansible crowd actually kind of looks like a database, right? And it's only got a very few set of modules, independent of your vendor mix, independent of the kind of network that you have, and of course, independent of the size, the size of the network. And what was at the core of our interaction with them is that we told them, look, NSO actually provides a fully CRUD interface, right? You can do create, you can do read, you can do update, and you can do delete. And actually, if you think about it, NSO makes your network look like one big data tree. So the modules doesn't have to be payload specific. They can be, think of them like verbs, right? You can actually have a module to, to read, you can have one to write, and you can have um, a couple of others, right? But it, it's more like creating modules as operations rather than specific to what the box is doing or to which box it is, right? 
And of course, there's transactions, right? One of the things that is hard with procedural things like Ansible is to have a reasonable fallout, a reasonable fault management, right? How do you actually um, react to the fact that one of your tasks fail? You know, it returns an error. What do you do now, right? Well, not much. At least when you interact with NSO, you can say that we know that we're going to be back to where we were before, right? So you don't have to work really hard in Ansible to try and capture and roll back things. You don't have to recreate pseudo state using playbooks. And of course, it's Yang based, right? So one of the things that we work pretty hard on is to make sure that whatever we send from Ansible is actually pre validated. So we can see that the string that we're sending to an I interface IP is an actual IP address. So instead of trying to push it to the network and have the device fail, we can say already before it hits CDB that this is not valid syntax, or for that matter, um, constraint checked uh, data. And the idea here, of course, is to delight the application people. Right? That's what we want to do. We want them to actually go from the network is of new no use for me. Um, it's mostly in my way and mostly because I don't even know how to talk to it, right? No one has given, given me the levers to do anything with the network. And if we can allow them to use their own language, their own tool, to reliably and robustly actually change the network, we've seen some pretty amazing, cool stuff happen, right? Because in the same playbook, as they spin up their application topologies, they can now have the network do stuff to their liking to actually decorate or improve on their applications using the language that they use, and in this case, uh, these people are pretty YAML, YAML heavy, heavy crowd. And of course, you know, for NSO, it's just another day of, of providing network abstraction using the, the, uh, the architectural patterns uh, that we've always had in place. So here are the actual modules. They started out very few, now they're five. Pretty obvious things. Um, verify fetches data, um, compares with what you have in the task. You have an action that actually just calls NSO actions. Um, config is, of course, where the fun starts, right? That's how you actually write in the data tree. Show is actually just subtree based, and query is the ability to send XPath expressions um, onto NSO. This is my favorite aspect of it, right? Consider playbooks. Playbooks express content, they express instance data in, in NSO terms, right? They do that in YAML, okay? Now, of course, we already have the entirety, for example, of the network configuration in, in CDB in NSO, right? And it's trivial, of course, to um, extract that data in JSON. So, for example, this curl call here, you know, actually fetches all of the configuration for all of the devices uh, in a running uh, NSO instance. And what you can do using um, a very small script called JSON to YAML, which is basically just um, uh, Python's JSON parser and YAML output uh, encoder, you can natively, of course, uh, translate the JSON into YAML. And it just so happens that we made it so that the YAML that comes out of that translation is the native YAML in the playbook. So what this does is that it actually removes the manual steps of developing your playbook content which is, for the Ansible crowd, a large part of what they do all day, every day. They mistype YAML, and they run it uh, in their playbook, and they uh, fix problems, and they rerun it until it actually works. So what this actually does is that it gives you the native encoding of what you need in your playbook without actually touching it, right? So this is something we're work working with the Ansible people to go towards an environment where actually creating playbooks is not a manual task. Right? Obviously, people, sh if they know what they're supposed to do with it, actually typing playbooks in should be a thing of the past. So this takes us a, a very good long way um, towards that. And of course, you guys, this is probably the wrong crowd to say this, but the cool thing then, of course, is that the Yang actually becomes the contract language. Actually, the combination of Yang and the instance data flowing over the, over the JSON encoding becomes the contract language between the infrastructure team um, and the DevOps teams that actually runs the application uh, farms, right? So when the um, infrastructure team, for example, 
I don't know, um, develops and launches a new service chain type that leads up to their application farm, they can obviously um, give the DevOps teams not only the Yang module, but an actual YAML encoding of a uh, example uh, work workload uh, for that service that they can then parameterize. Uh, quite popular in uh, Ansible is the use of uh, um, Jinja, Jinja 2 templates, right? So again, gone is now the idea of manually typing with someone on the phone a payload that you can, can or, or, or maybe can't send uh, to the network itself. So it becomes much more of not just an API, but it actually a contract style relationship within the infrastructure and the, and the DevOps teams. And we've seen some pretty awesome um, uh, developments here where you have uh, <laughs> application teams suddenly taking an interest of the depth of the stack of what the network can do for them, because it's now so easily available using their, their native language. So the modules themselves, so verify. First of all, every module kind of has a little bit of a boilerplate header, so all tasks, so this is a task called verify interfaces up. Um, you have the module name, so that's underscore NSO, NSO underscore verify. Of course, you need to tell the module the URL for the JSON RPC, uh, username and password. This is, let's say, the raw playbook content. Most people actually factor out things like username and password and have that in include files. But this is the very simplistic version. Then comes data. And that's the thing, right? For us or for NSO, it's just data. It can be, like in this case, in the device tree. It could also be in the services tree. Now you can start thinking about your network like a big data tree, right? So in, thi this, in this case, it just so happens that we're looking into the device tree, devices device, CE0, we're looking in the live status subtree, you know, that, that, that's the just-in-time uh, operational state subtree of the device tree. Um, there's supposed to be something called an interfaces list with an interface with a name of gigabit ethernet 0 slash 12, and the state is supposed to be up. So when you run this task, it will succeed if this holds true, and it will fail if it doesn't. And of course, this part of the, of the tree uh, could easily have been fetched by a, an appropriate curl call into the JSON interface, right? And, of course, we return a list of paths and expected values and found value pairs if the validation fails, right? So you can do all kinds of cool stuff with the output here, depending on what the deviation is. A very common thing, of course, is to run an action. For example, sync from or sync to as a handler um, response to maybe a failed verify. So this is action, kind of same thing, uh, URL, username, password. Now, this is actually calling Yang actions, right, or Yang operations. So we need the path to the action. And if the action requires input, then, of course, you actually encode that, too, in YAML. Um, we can do a couple of cool things with the responses. If you can check if the output uh, actually has some content that you uh, want to match against to make it invalid and it will fail if that's present. It, you can do the reverse, meaning that if this output is not part of the response, then you fail. And you can also do validate strict. Now we're in the weeds. Um, you fail if the entirety of output required doesn't match all the output data. So it's just three means of responding to the output data from the NSO action module. Config, this is where, again, this is kind of where it takes off. Same thing, URL, username, password. We're in the data tree here. Uh, obviously, you guys know that this is our demo <laughs> environment. We look at, we're looking at the services side of things. L3 VPN. This is actually adding a leg in a VPN using an Ansible module. Just you know, w w when you show this to the Ansible crowd, to the to the to the application people, then they start realizing that it's not just poking holes in VLANs, which is about the the um, complexity of previous attempts or maybe even current attempts of putting some networking to Ansible, but you can actually spin up real networking services. So in this case, of course, we push this configuration, and you ha we have a little meta statement, a little keyword called underscore underscore state, which is along the lines of how this works in other modules, that says, make sure that this is actually uh, in sync. Right? So if something is missing, make it, make it happen. So, you know, may partially exist, but make it in sync. And actually, you can do the reverse, too. You can call it absent and say, this must not exist. It's a little bit weird, but it actually turns out to be very useful in more, more ambitious playbooks. Show, 
does what you think it does. Very simple, username, password, you have a path. And operational true means that, yes, I also want to see the operational data. So this, this uh, will be a, ve a very large amount of data is going to come out of, uh, out of this, show, uh, this call here. You know, all data under device's device, and uh, including the operational state. And it actually, actually dumps out the response, which is unusual in, in Ansible terms. Normally, you don't read back things from, from uh, tasks. They us usually just fail or, or don't fail. Uh, but in this case, we're going to dump everything in JSON. Query, same thing, except for the fact that it actually doesn't show it here. But the, exp the, the expression here under XPath is actually an XPath expression. So you can do um, actual XPath queries on the northbound interface here. All right. That was the entirety of the thing. Actually, I'm gonna, now that we have so much time, I'm actually going to I've set up so we can show a, a brief demo. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually run a demo that comes out of, as I mentioned before, the NSO developer GitHub. So if you go to the NSO DevNet environment, you will find a link to the NSO developer uh, public GitHub. And you can see this demo here that actually walks you through everything I'm doing now using a local NetSim environment. And what I actually, th the one thing that I wanted to show you is how you convert this um, response here um, from to Jamble, hang on here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, hang on. Hey, hey. Do some brief cutting and pasting. Uh, here we go. Here we go. So here's what it, that's, that's what I did then. So using that curl um, call, of course, asking for the configuration of Juniper Zero, comes out, of course, in JSON. And you simply shoot that through the JSON to YAML script. And out comes then the native encoding of what you can put straight into your, into your playbook. So you take the appropriate subset of this and you hook it into the playbook that you need, right? So if I wanted to check, if, if I said that, for example, um, this Junos interface configuration is the default uh, for what I need, you create a verify template in YAML. You may or you probably will Jinjaify um, the names, uh, the identifiers here. 
um, and the IP addresses, right? But again, you don't have to, because of course the alternative here is to know that you need to type this into your playbooks. And now you get it um, straight out of um, the native encoding. And of course you can all do all kinds of include file trickery and, and uh, variable substitution straight into the playbook itself. So Carl, is, is this something that we will cover uh, in the lab later today? Thank you for asking that nice setup question. So for those of you who are, who are joining us for the lab, uh, this is actually a, a crucial part of the lab is actually be very hands-on with our Ansible modules. So thank you for that question, Nicholas. All right, any questions about the work we're doing that with Ansible? Good, Scott. Say that. So one, one more time. Yeah. So the uh, you know so last year I, I'm I'm very interested. I love it. So um, the other side is of course installing NC, uh, NSO and and doing all the things that have to be done. So is there an idea for that? You know, kind of a comprehensive like we're going to go that way. And and how does it you know uh, relate to NCT? Because you know I can't see inside NCT. I can see inside this. I can do whatever I want with this. You know. There we, you know, that's the question. Uh, okay, so yeah, so as you could see throughout the presentations here, several of our customers are using Ansible heavily to manage the NSO application itself and the way it's configured and, for example, uh, the way LSA or clusters are set up. Right now, there's no concrete plans to actually develop anything. One thing that I didn't mention is that the, mon the modules that I just talked through are upstream, so they're actually part of uh, Ansible Core since Ansible 2.5. We currently don't have any plans for specific modules for managing NSO, but maybe that's something we should look into. Um, I know we have, uh, I don't know that there's anything on the developer GitHub yet, but we know that there are customers with pretty extensive playbooks developed for NSO that we would love you know, for them to share more widely. So maybe something to think of, actually. So, so I did put up, you know, it's probably, if you look for N NSO and, and Ansible, you'll, you'll see it. I did put up a very simple set of things to start to do that, and I think over the year there has been one contribution. Ah. You know, we've all been busy, so I get it. Um, <laughs> but you know, and it's very simplistic, and I know. Where you know, is it? Is it at NSO Developer? It, it should be. Awesome. Okay, somewhere here. It's somewhere there. Yeah. yeah. Cool. It, you know, it, it, again, not much activity, but if we can build it, you know, that that would be great. Yeah. So, you know, it works for us in very simple situations, but, you know, obviously there's, there's better people and, and things have, have uh, grown since then. You know, we, you know lots of, you know, Jinja is a, is, a, is a great new addition, so we could do something like that. So sure. Let's Good call it. to action. Go take a look at Scott's contribution and see if you can, uh, can contribute. Any other questions on the topic of NSO and Ansible? Okay, so and keep 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 uh, an eye out for this. Uh, we are still kind of working uh, tightly together. Ansible has every year something called they call Ansible Fest. Happens in October. This year it's going to be in San Francisco, and we're now working on what to actually um, unveil at that uh, point. So, um, if you're going, come see me. Uh, if you're not, you know, take a look at the recordings. I will be. If not keynoting, then definitely presenting our joint next step work uh, around that time frame. That's around October. All righty, so with that, we're on to the next step in the agenda, where I ask my buddy Victor to come up and talk about NSO usability. Hi. Um, so my name is Victor Leon. I work in the engineering and architecture team. So most of the people here care very much about what's inside of NSO. I care very much about what's outside of NSO. I look a lot at architectures of applications on NSO and how to use NSO. And I'm here a little bit to tell you all how important you are. And we've seen over the last few years that NSO is getting a lot of spread. You're all NSO users, developers, but what we're finding is that not everything we do with NSO is obvious to everyone. Now, we have two parts to take here, right? We can either 
sit on ivory tower and claim that what we do is perfect and needs no further explanation. But that's perhaps not the best option. Instead, we've realized that there might be some things that could either be simpler or could be explained better. So I'm working quite a lot on, I call it NSO usability in the widest possible sense of the world. It is trying to improve the NSO experience, trying to make it easy to adopt NSO into an organization. Now, this is a hugely complex task, right? All of you who have tried this know there are a number of problems. And some of them are really simple, like um, getting NSO, getting documentation. And we have the NSO Developer Hub that should be able to help you with all of those starting questions. But going further in, we realize that for a lot of you, this is quite a big change. We heard Cisco IT talk about you know, having a mix of developers and networking people. And we see in different customers that what they do with NSO varies quite a lot. Some people put it in fairly pure networking organizations where most people are networking engineers. Now, networking engineers are great people. Some are best friends of networking engineers. But the problem is that NSO and orchestration, automation, SDN is representative of a transformation into software. We are making more and more of the network into software. You know, we talk about network programmability, but the first step of network programmability is just having an API to the device. What NSO does is put all of the other software engineering tricks into your toolbox. You get the abstractions, you get the, the modernization. So all of those software principles that you, that's, those of our software people have learned to love are now becoming available to you. And I, I went to school for this. So I hope it's not super easy to learn. And, and we, have looked at this and sort of tried to talk to the customers. And we see two obvious things. And the first one is to try to guide the service developer. So that's something we thought a lot about. Who is the service developer? And the service developer is a fairly broad category. It's all of you, all the people that work in developing the services, all of you that work in defining, testing, implementing the services. and what we see here is that a service developer comes in, in many forms. And a service developer, well, some of you might be everything. Some people like me come from a software background and have to learn about IP addresses and subnet masking. Some people come from a network engineering background and have to learn about uh, design patterns and uh, Git and stuff like that. And what we want to do is to try and help enable, guide the service developer. We think that for all network automation, and certainly for what we are doing, this is a key person, and you are all very important persons for us. And the other part is enhancing developer tooling. And this is about product enhancement. This is about you telling me what you need and me trying to make Carl do it and him done making the engineering do it. So this is sort of an open question. I feel free to grab me later. If we have obvious product enhancements, if we have tooling, if we have other things we can do to make your life easier, we'd love to hear that. Um, when I started this work, this was very much my focus. I started out trying to map the options we had and trying to see this is one of my first slides I made a few months ago when I started this work, trying to see what are our options, what can we do, what can we explore. And originally, I was very much <laughs> in the tooling camp. I tried to map out all the possibilities, but I was pretty sure I would end up thinking that tools were the right choice and the right answer for everything. But the more I work, the more I go to sort of the left-hand side, trying to help customers understand about processes, trying to improve documentation. 
And one of the big things that I've taken away from the conversations I've had is that we need to be much stronger in providing best practices. We have to start saying more clearly what the best way to use the product is. Because we have a platform, and there was a little bit of talk about that Itanishal had a, a lot of nice things to say about platforms versus solutions. And, you know, the ultimate platform is a C compiler. With that, you can do everything. And then we start to limit our options a little bit as we build a more prescriptive platform. And I think that we need to put more guardrails up, perhaps not technical guardrails, you can still do whatever you want, but we should at least try and tell you a safe path through the product. So this is the work that I've been working on. I've talked to some customers, I've talked a lot internally, um, and this is work that will be continuing. We'll see some documentation, and some best practices, and some, some work around processes, how to run a project, how to set up uh, CICD processes, all that stuff that we've heard about here. And hopefully sometime during autumn we'll start seeing sort of major updates to those areas. So I was really called up here to try and say this and try to sort of point to, to, to the things we want to do. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so please feel free to either ask a question now or grab me later on and give me ideas, input, and yeah, uh, that was all I wanted to say. Can you go back one slide? Of course. This is an awesome opportunity to ask you guys, is there anything that's not on this slide that we should do? in terms of NSO usability. I know this is broad, it's on purpose. There's, of course, a massive amount of actual tactics uh, behind all these boxes. But broadly, is there anything we should be doing or thinking about in terms of the experience of using NSO that you don't see here? So this is perfect. Oh. I mean, oh. I yeah, here we go. Scott. I always have something to say. So, so I guess the one thing is, as I go through, you know, think about my journey and, and trying to train new developers, you, you know, it comes down to, to me, it comes down to, gee, there are, now, you know, you just gave us, I think, an eighth interface, you know, with Ansible, you know, you know, which over the years we've grown and there's Nabu and Mappy and, you know, so inside usability, when I think of usability, I think of the developers and yes. trying to make new services. So. Which interface, you know, are, are we ever going to consolidate, deprecate, actually get rid of some, you know, we've, you know, we've written even tools on top of that so that we only have one interface to use, you know, when we, when we use it, you know, a data ductus. So, um, you know, the, the, the plethora, there's so many ways to do things that I never knew which one to use, and, and now I do because I've been around. But I, I remember the days when, I didn't know which way to start and which one to use and you know which place in the Java doc to start. So right. something about that is you know would be a good thing. Yeah, and I think that the, there are two parts of that question. One is how to know what to use, and I think that for the new developers, we need to look at what the path into NSO is. Today, if you open up the documentation, everything is technically there but there, it's a bunch of 500-page PDFs or 300-page PDFs or whatever. So we need to, to map the path through that experience much more clearly, tell them where to start, tell them when to use a subscriber, when to use CDB, when to use API, when to use the map API, and all that. But the other question you're asking is, like, if we take the easy example, there is a CDB API and a map API. And for many reasons, they are very different for us. But do we want to unify stuff like that more long term? And it would probably be nice, but there are, I don't know. It's tough to remove things. Tough to remove things. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we might not have, I mean, remove is one thing, but would we unify them in the API? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Anything else? Anything else? Thank you, Scott. 
Hand came up. Quick, Mike. Uh, Say that one more time, louder. Troubleshooting guide? Yeah, sure. definitely. Um, definitely needed. Uh, there's been, in the last few NSO releases, there's been a lot of improvements in tooling. We have the new pipe debug uh, command. We have new traces for performance and stuff like that. And we are getting audit improvements and stuff like that. So it will become easier, but I agree. It's still very hard to troubleshoot in certain situations, and we definitely need to get better at that. Ah, upstairs. <laughs> okay, well, so, so there are two parts here, right? One Re is the... Repeat, repeat the question. Yeah, so the yeah. question was about examples, and that the examples in documentation are very simple. And I have a question. Are, do you mean the examples in the actual documentation or the separate examples in the uh, sort of in the delivery? In the yeah, I agree. Um, and I think I've thought a lot about the documentation, and the truth is that it's quite a lot of work to make big changes, but yeah, definitely think about something like that. I think that with what we should do, I don't know if I believe in having. Um, super big examples in the middle of documentation, but we should reference the external examples more clearly from documentation. Definitely. There was a hand in the back. That's there. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to see a little bit more uh, quality of life changes. And on the tools, I think there's a, a need for some polish as well, because you, you do uh, give us a lot of tools to work, with, but some of them end up in sort of a minimum viable product state for mm. very long, and they sort of don't get uh, really integrated into NSO. They're sort of external tools. Can, can I give a few examples of, of things that, you, that would improve your quality of life? Do you know something that, that would help? I mean, or, or give an example of a tool that's not... Well, I, I, I had a discussion about this with Moberry previously about... Uh, uh, swagger functionality and your thoughts about getting yeah. that into into NSO yeah. and uh, the initial thought there was external tool and sort of you can put it on your swagger server somewhere and so on I like to see that type of thing get into NSO as a product and that that doesn't really go for that alone I don't want a dozen command line in uh, <laughs> Uh, the yeah, tools yeah, that they yeah. can use. I want uh, uh, yeah, I see the point. Um, and I think that often we don't really know what our customers use. We are going to need a user survey sooner or later to try and see which parts are the most used ones to make sure we put our effort. Um, but yeah. yes, uh, I agree. Good point. Yep, agree. Very good point. Now the floodgates are open. Look. They keep coming. Awesome. Another question. Oh, OK. First, yes. Yeah, so um, based on my experience, one thing that I noticed uh, that probably fall into the best practices section of it is to uh, figure out what piece of orchestration should go into the uh, service development or into the development on the NSO versus the orchestration that should sit on top of NSO yeah. because yes. that's kind of sometimes becomes a little bit um, complicated that this should be part of within the NSO development piece or it should be part of uh, yes. outside orchestration. That is an awesome point. And to be honest, I mean, historically, we've always thought that that was so context specific and so solution specific that we shouldn't say anything about it. Which, again, back to Victor's point, it's time to get yeah. out of that position. And, and also, Trish, I think we've, what we've always wanted the default answer to be that everything should be NSO. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's part of our quest of for world yeah. dominance. <laughs> but yes, uh, I agree. And that's, that's definitely something that will be in, is on the roadmap to try and explain yeah. what a good design could look like and would look like. Right, some, some kind of sample uh, use case that we can say in this situation, it was better to have that on the outer um, yep, exactly versus right. on the other side. And as you can imagine, this is the type of conversation that we're having with, for example, our buddies over at iTensual, because it becomes very real in the integration 
uh, with, with customers, what data sits in which system, and it's life cycled and owned in which system. So you're good. We should probably just share more. I mean, that, that comes down to sharing our experiences. There's a question in the back. Yeah, awesome. Yep. Uh, yeah, I was actually just talking to Jan about this on the way back last night, but um, one thing I noticed is the Cisco Developer Hub is, is pretty nice. It's useful, but I think something like a Slack channel where it's a little bit more real time, have a little more interactive, would be really, really nice to have. Who in here would join a Slack channel for NSO? That's enough. Okay. Point well taken. Yeah. Well, yeah. It might have to be a Spark channel. Ah, uh, IRC. <laughs> We'll start with having an with email fight shopping. about which one to use. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Let's start with platform yeah. discussion. But yes, would be nice. More. Give it, oh, good. Yeah, uh, I have a question about uh, uh, actually comments about uh, documentation in general. So, for example, the command NCS, there are a lot of hidden options that's not documented. Uh, if you do dash dash help, it doesn't show everything. You do the man NCS, doesn't show everything. And it looks like there's two two person writing the same thing. That the one writes the code, putting the options; the other one putting the help. That doesn't show everything. Uh, and there shouldn't be. I mean, as part of the development process, they do write documentation. Some of the NCS options are hidden on purpose. Yeah. Uh, but why? He knows know? about them. Sorry. But he knows about them. Yes, they're widely <laughs> known. Yeah. And some of them. I, there are some examples where they are hidden on purpose for good reason, yeah. and then there we'll be forced to mention the documentation yeah. later on. <laughs> but yes, that's definitely one of the things that should be, it's okay to have hidden options sometimes for troubleshooting flags we don't want to have on, but I think that we should at least be yeah. systematic yeah. about it. Of course. Good point. More? Oh, Mark, yes. This will uh, be good. Um, I, I noticed the lack of operations having a box up here yeah and, and you know, HA is is always a, a lengthy topic of discussion so I, I wonder what your thoughts are on on usability around high availability um, yeah I, I have lots of thoughts uh, but yes I have I have sort of not ignored but I've put off operations a little bit because the fear we've seen that we have a lot of our problems before we get into operation a lot of problems are with service development rather than operations. HA in particular is one of those things that I I don't like our story on. But yeah, uh, I think as we go further, as we get more time, we definitely need to improve the operational story and documentation. And there are, uh, and especially HA, I would say. Yep, good point. More, we're taking copious notes. Oh, good. In the back? Way up in the back? So, fairly small question. Uh, is the NCS binary ever going to be renamed to oh. NSO? <laughs> Who here <laughs> wants us to rename the binary? I mean, it's a bit confusing for I know. users. I, I, I agree. So. I agree. Um, it's it's one of these things that are almost like a standing um, joke. But you uh, know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's it's Cisco and it's so powered by TLF NCS. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Implemented by TLF NCS. Um, yeah. No, but it's 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 of course it's one of these those things that the the side effect complexities of doing that, not only internal to the engineering team, but actually to the installed base, is uh, is pretty insane. Um, so I, I think that's going to be that's uh, that's going to be a hard one. We're going to put that into like, let's think about it. You can always add sim links. Yeah, uh, as a soft link. Yeah, sure. Should, but yeah, but it, it is a complex problem yeah. for so many reasons. But yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, a couple of smaller questions. One is going from non LSA to LSA is a little bit more work on developer side. So do we have anything you know in plans to make it a little bit simpler on that side and the other comment sorry uh, first let me uh, there's no short term plans there are long term plans to make the lsa architecture easier to consume uh, we are working on some documentation to make make it easy yeah. to plan ahead for lsa and try to design the right way but there is no no explicit tooling right now but it, that's probably 
yeah, the long I term. Think the, the, the PLM response would be this. We're laying the base for improving that over time. But there's, like Victor said, there's nothing on the immediate roadmap for it. Yeah, we'll get to, we'll get to, to that whole story. And the other question on training side, I'm coming from software background, so whenever I look at network config, it is kind of, uh, you know, not good for me. <laughs> and probably it's the other way as well, people coming from network background has the same, uh, you know, challenges working with the software. So from the training perspective, do you want to tailor the content a little bit, like some content more towards software side? Because if you ask me, I don't look at the device config, I want to update CDB and be done with it. <laughs> but if you look from the network perspective, they are more into config perspective. Yeah. So maybe slicing the training in such a way that this part is relevant to software, people just learn that one, and this is relevant to the network guys. Yeah, uh, tr training is, is a complex question, but and I think people, you know, that they set certain prerequisites and then you assume that that would be enough. I think that long term, we need to move over. Training is one thing because it's a slow moving beast, but at least documentation and online training, we definitely should try and, and make it, because if you look at what Cisco has, right? Cisco has great online training to help you understand networking. This is the bread and butter of the company. So if we can steal or borrow a little bit of that, and then a little bit, you know, programming training is widely available everywhere else. So if you could put together a path that, that brings you to the same goal, I think that would be great. And I, but I, I'm going to quote you on that. I just put it in the CDB and be done with it. I <laughs> like that abstraction. Just, and ew, some stuff happens in the network. Ugh, don't want to yeah. see that. <laughs> oh, good. Um, so we, we've done a lot of configuration now, and um, we are sort of starting to do more operational data, getting things from the root and using it for troubleshooting this. And the overall ergonomics there is still very, very bad. Um, you use like the Juno's RPC and the live status, and this still feels um, very bad. Mm -hmm. So it's like when you log into a, to a router and you start using show BGP or whatever, I mean, you can feel that this is an interface that's actually made for troubleshooting. Yeah. Um, yeah. And the uh, experience you get in NSO is that this is made for being frustrated. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it is, I mean, it's really not, so NSO will never be a performance management platform. It will never be the time series database. Uh, a lot of the problems with operational data is really a problem with the device. But you, you don't have... So <clears throat> if you actually have a NetConf device that help or has operational data over NetConf, then you have a pretty nice experience. If you have SNMP, and I don't, then you can get SNMP data, and it wor works fairly well. But yeah, sorry? Uh, I don't agree. Even with Juniper that has NetConf RPCs, it's still a bad experience. So would you rather, I mean, is it more like uh, the I human experience of it? Like so reading both, both the, the human and the yeah. um, developer side of things. Well, it's, why? It's I mean, like the, the ergonomics is just bad. I mean, make things easy. Yeah. But I, I can you help? Uh, I mean, I, I would love to understand because... So just if you want to write something, it's like this huge CLI command, and if you log into the router, it's like 20 characters, and you start getting useful BGP information. No, I think, I think that's worth talking about. And, and it comes uh, as a uh, side effect. I yeah. would love just to th talk more about that particular problem. Um, <coughs> because... Of course, it will always be a bit of a prefix to, to, to name the device and stuff like that, but it shouldn't be much worse than that. Right. Um, but yeah, let, let's go back, get back to that later and, and look at it. Oh, they just keep, this is a gift that keeps giving. John, down here. This is about the uh, NSO sizing guide. We have some kind of a documentation available, but uh, from the real world implementation, can we you know look at you know making it as a standard guide, you know, guiding mm. principle or some kind of benchmarking data there? 
to help out? There is a draft yeah. circulating internally. Yes. yes. So w one of the things that we can say it's com it's coming, right? And it's another example of where we had to go outside of our comfort zone because, as you you probably experienced, our default answer is it depends, right? And and then we leave it there. Uh, now we have a body of experience that's decent enough that we can actually. Yeah, play and it's it. a little bit of nostalgia for me because the first thing I ever did at TLF was the sizing guide that's been circulated old one. <laughs> the 3.11 one. Right, right. So the first thing I did. <laughs> and what we have, starting in what we have circulated internally, is a draft that looks yes. good. In the end, it will always be a little bit of it, it depends, because you can never know what you're doing with the system, but it will be very helpful, I think. Yeah. Okay, last question. It's a more probably a question of error handling than of documentation, but still. Uh, sometimes uh, the errors, we are actually, our team is, uh, consumes northbound API of NSO, so we don't have like a very low level experience or anything like this, but still. Uh, sometimes errors that are coming from NSO are pretty much deceiving. Like for instance, when device is unavailable during stage communication, it returns 400 malformed message. Or uh, sometimes when, for instance, service is missing and we are trying to update it using HTTP patch method, it says uh, missing element or something. So maybe these cases should be either improved or maybe documented better. Yeah. Yes. I definitely agree. I will take that back to the team and see what they say. Yeah, yeah. An overhaul of the error messaging in general, I think. Yeah, is, uh, I mean, and the rest one in this case, but yeah. Good. All right. Excellent. Thank input. you, Victor. I Thank you very much. Talk to you later. And again, this is my slot, so I can allow myself to be all over the map. So again, I'm going to do this. Who here actually have heard about ONAP before? A decent chunk. Very good. So then that's perfect that I have Frank here to talk about ONAP. Welcome, Frank. Whee. Good morning. <laughs> uh, so um, I think just prior to the roadmap discussion, I'd like to go and put or try to put NSO into a little bit of a larger context. And that larger context can be ONAP. Uh, by Collins' measure, almost everybody is aware of ONAP. But let's get ourselves a little bit of a quick refresher. And I'd like to go back to what uh, Hiroki's son from NTT Communications uh, started off pretty much on the first day of the NSO developer event here. And he started off with the overall larger SDN vision or architecture. SDN was there to go and abstract state from individual network devices into a bit of a controller and then make the overall network operate as one. That was one piece. The other piece is extract state from the network get that out of the way, uh, extract state from the network, learn from that state, enhance that war, amend that with policy, feed it back to the application so that you can make better decisions towards the network via the orchestration cycle. So we set out as an industry roughly five to seven years ago to implement that virtuous cycle, right? Extract state, pull it into analytic subsystems, feed it back to the application so that the application can make better decisions and have the network operate in its means. And amend that with security and the likes. In order to facilitate that larger system, well, if you need to go and compose this out of individual Lego blocks, what would you need to go do? Well, you have your base layer, you have your physical network, you have storage compute, you have a virtualization layer on top, and then you have a series of domain-specific controllers for the network, for virtual network functions, or for virtual functions per C. You need something that handles the virtualization layer, so the Vim layer, be it Kubernetes, be it OpenStack, pick your choice. And then, well, you typically have a data sharing mechanism, be it at CD, uh, be it Kafka as a bus for operational data. Um, so something that distributes and shares states across all these various components that you have, be it operational data or configuration data. And on top of that, you have something that does this overall domain-wide orchestration and also analytic subsystems and, well, an overall inventory database for your entire system. So to understand server state, application state, analytic subsystem state, everything. You want to go and expose that to the site you want to operate it. So something operations manager to go and lifecycle manage the components to go and scale in and scale out. And another key piece that 
Well, we've been discussing over and over again from a service design perspective, there is something that isn't really impacting immediately the running system because you feed it into the running system. This is the design time phase where you lay out a service and laying out a service means dealing with licenses, dealing with legal, making sure that the business processes match what you're laying out as a service. So all of this we needed to go and compose. And there is two ways to go and compose this. The historic way to go and compose this was go to one vendor with a pile of money and say, have fun. And you got something that was a tightly integrated system from one particular solution. And even if you entered the NFV market today, right? Um, if you looked at the initial NFV value propositions that were put forward, all of them came as integrated stacks. NFV orchestrator, NFV manager, NFV entity, it's all tightly integrated. Why? Because people said, well, it's harder if I do it otherwise. Now, if you want to go and say, hmm, I want this from company A, and I want this from company B, and this from company C, because I believe in best of breed, well, most of the people would desire to go to the right-hand side, but they've been locked into the left-hand side. Why? Because there was no way to go and compose this in an open way. Or composition meant, again, hiding a pile of cash to one particular entity to go and integrate it just for you. So roughly two, three years ago, in open source, there's been a trend to move away from building individual components only to systems integrate these components. The first effort at hand was OPNFV, Open Platform for Network Function Virtualizations, which builds a Vim layer in the open. But we can go do more. If we want to go and build this entire puzzle, well, we can go and choose component tree in open source from upstream in almost every single bucket. So you have orchestration capability, Komunda as a workflow engine, Aria Tosca. There's been a bunch of things out there, inventory, there's loads of databases out there, analytic subsystems have been built like Panda, and network controllers like Open Daylight. So the individual ingredients were there. Well, somebody said, well, let's go and set off and compose this thing in the open once for everybody and compose it in a way that I come up with a reference architecture that is running code that I can test against, that I can integrate against, and break this kind of all-in-one thing only. And if we break this all-in-one thing only, we come up with something composable and move best of breed in and allow everybody to particip participate for the benefit of the industry. So I think if this goes well, we enable an industry. And what ONAT set out is the design, design, creation, orchestration, automation, and lifecycle management of networks, of networks, physical and virtual. Loads of focus initially on the, uh, on the virtual side because that's quote unquote easier because it's mostly greenfield, but the physical part is a key part of that, that contribution. So why is ONAP so hype? Why does everybody in this room know about ONAP? Because in essence, 60% of all worldwide subscribers are somewhat represented by ONAP because the carriers that represent these subscribers are active in ONAP. So you can pick the big names, right? AT&T, Bell Canada, China Mobile, China Telecom, um, Europeans like, like Orange are there. So Vodafone, all the big names you'll find in this basket. Verizon is there. And that's the driving piece of this puzzle, because the belief is if somebody can make it happen, kind of solving this big puzzle and making this a Lego puzzle with open, composable interfaces, well, it's this crowd. And they set out to go and get it done. Getting it done was also initially even an effort of merging two initiatives of getting it done. AT&T started with open Ecomp. China Mobile started with OpenO. And they were, say, comparing notes and said, well, we're trying to very much do the same thing. Let's do it together. Good thing. So have it once and for everybody. So it's a merger of OpenO and uh, 
op uh, and, and open ecomp, and that happened in March 2017. So we are roughly a little bit more than one year into the project. And, uh, well, I'm happy to be on the TSC there. Um, but we have a bunch of actual members and a bunch of contribution uh, of companies contributing. Apparently, there is more people being member than contributing. Why? Because lots of people sit on the fence and kind of watch and want to go and leverage this thing more than a as, a, as a reference framework than actively contributing code into this thing because they're interested in the APIs. They're not interested in the actual code component. We've come up with a first release that was Amsterdam. Uh, we just, last week, we launched Beijing as the second release, and towards the end of the year, we have Casablanca. So you notice oh, ONAP um, names releases after cities um, with uh, kind of browsing through the alphabet. Now, um, if you look at the overall project map in ONAP, you notice that every single bucket, almost every single bucket, is populated by a project. So ONAP stood up individual projects for almost every single component on this Lego block thing. So we have components for network control, VNF lifecycle management, VM control or container control, for data movement, uh, for orchestration overall, inventory analytics, uh, running the overall system. So all of these individual line items are there, and all of these individual projects are composition projects. They are leveraging upstream, and they are building glue code. They are not building things themselves. So if you look at a policy engine, underneath is Jules. Um, if you look at a network controller, underneath there is open daylight. They've do done pixie dust on top, but they are running on top of vanilla architecture. Same thing, operations, ONAP operations manager runs on Kubernetes. So Amsterdam was the first thing to go and bring this, these two architectures together. One China mobile driven OpenO, one AT&T driven uh, Open Ecomp. And the first thing, if you started to use it and, well, it was fantastic that they've done that in six months only. Looked a little bit still like rough on the edges. So you had to go and do certain kind of back end rest calls to go and fix it so that the entire flow worked through. But they got something to work. And they, they did this by driving to two use cases or two driving use cases. One virtual residential CPE and another one was Vaulty that was used to go and facilitate that integration. And you've seen components there on that architecture map, and all of them I think I mentioned briefly earlier on. If you look at the Beijing architecture, so the release that we just concluded and that we just finished up, the picture looks almost the same. Why? Because the focus was on scalability, hardening, getting it to work. By now, most of the rough edges have disappeared. So there is no longer a kind of preloading on configuration data with a REST call so that you make this overall call flow work in its entirety. What we've also added is something that is really to the side of here, this ONAP Operations Manager OOM. Historically, the first version deployed as VMs, at least 11 VMs, using a heat template. Very static, very difficult, and very fragile. Those days have gone. We're now deploying ONAP on a container-based uh, on a container-based uh, environment. So every single component lives in a container by now, can be scheduled by Kubernetes, so they can even e easily version the thing, scale it in, and scale it out. So this is a piece par uh, part of the puzzle. And with that, we also scaled down ONAP as an integration environment from systems requirements above 400 gig to something less than 100 gig. So how do you consume ONAP? If you were to go and consume ONAP, you can obviously say, I want the whole blob. And you can go and run it in your lab. And by now, as I said, it even installs without too much of a pain. And you can use individual components out of ONAP. So you can pick and choose and say, well, I like maybe the orchestration and inventory component, but the remainder I'm not really ready for, because all I want is physical network provisioning. Or I can take it the other way around, and we have a fair amount of service providers that we're talking to today that say, well, I see ONAP as the evolution of the Etsy architecture, because Etsy gave me a, a architecture, a blueprint. ONAP gives me an implemented reference architecture with defined APIs that I can integrate against, that I can test against, 
so that I can start to say, OK, I can take open source component A, vendor component B, and the likelihood of these guys playing together, if they claim they work together, is very high, because the vendor was able to go and test against owner prior. I am able to go and test against that particular component prior. So they're leveraging this as a reference architecture, as opposed to only the classic open source consumption model, where you say, well, I'm going to go use it, or I'm going to go ask a systems integrator to step up um, running it for me. So in Cisco, we started to go and look at this complementation of, of individual ONAP components with Cisco components, and I've just put that up here. Um, so we are kind of all over the map. But what we want to go and home in on is a little bit on the kind of where does an NSO fit, right? Um, so we've been in various areas active in ONAP. Loads of the componentry that ONAP uses, Cisco had a handle on. And Cisco is very much a component company. And, and, and to some extent, you can see NSO as a component of the larger picture, right? Um, so we supplied componentry for, well, the individual VNFs that you're running. If you're running virtual residential CPE, you're running basically on top of FIDO VPP. Um, if you're using the controllers, you're using Open Daylight. And Cisco launched or helped create Open Daylight as a project in the past. So we're active in many places, and we are pitching or building together solutions like our self-organizing network solutions that we have. We have a POC that integrates and works against ONAP, where you can go and schedule these individual VMs on top of ONAP. More interestingly is, well, how do you do that? Or how do you get into this overall story with NSO, and what could you do with that? We have one larger customer, and also it's one of the public uh, announced customers that use ONAP in production. And they started off doing something very, very simple. They're not saying, I'm using all these sturdy components. You've got to go start somewhere. And they started with physical network provisioning. Very simple use case. All of, those, uh, all of you guys know that. Very likely, L3 provisioning of Cisco boxes and Juniper boxes. Straightforward. Kind of straightforward. Because what they wanted to go do is provision these individual network elements. And they used Open Daylight as a translation layer of REST to NetConf. So there is nothing model driven really here. They are just driving a series of configurations onto the various devices. And they're driving the series of configuration using the ONAP workflow engine. Underneath, there is Komunda. So it's old school, sometimes called legacy business uh, process modeling, right? And notation, PPNM. Um, so that was a starting point for them. And at the same time, they're extracting that state into an inventory so that they have a starting point. That's the first step. They haven't even used the SDN controller that ex resides in ONAP. That could be the next step. So if you're evolving from, I'm just using basic workflows because I want to go and integrate and not leave behind my initial legacy part. Uh, but I have certain components that can more easily embrace model-driven workflows. Then, well, I can go and start to use the network controller that exists in ONAP, SDNC. And SDNC, if you look at it, the base platform is Open Daylight. So the Yang tooling is there. Southbound interfaces, NetConf, Yang are there. It's all great. But what Open Daylight lacks today is anything service logic. So ONAP provided the service level pixie dust on top. So that you can have L2 VPN constructs, L3 VPN constructs, traffic engineer tunnels, and you can go and stitch them together into larger service models. So that's something that ONAP's done. Now, this sounds familiar, right? Or? So if you map this out, you have a kind of translation layer to Yang. And then you have something that does service logic or service manager, right? So in theory, you can go and say, well, um, I can go use this, or I'm using a hardened component that I already have in my network. So that's a natural place if we're evolving into simple device provisioning on operations to go and leverage NSO. And, well, we can go and hook that state up, and Carl said earlier on, like, in theory, that's a single REST call to go and extract that state. Uh, you can push that state up into ANAI, 
because this is where you ultimately want to go and consolidate all the other inventory state from your VMs, from your uh, other ONAP components. That's the physical side of the thing. And it's a relatively concise, small area of the physical side of the thing. We can go then start to embrace the virtual side of the thing. And for virtual side of the thing, well, ONAP has a VNF controller, i.e. a VNF manager plus a VNF orchestrator. That's a component called VFC. That is a component that was um, sourced from uh, the China Mobile Open Open Project side of the house and evolved. And they have, again, a two-layer architecture in there with the, uh, NF, uh, the NFVO layer, the orchestrator layer, and either a specific VNF manager or a generic VNF manager. So you have a pluggable architecture where you can go and plug multiple things underneath. And you see where that's heading, right? NFV orchestrator? Mm -hmm. Maybe you can go and use NSO for that because we have people using NSO for that today in conjunction with the Elastic Service Controller. And that doesn't mean that it's necessarily the only play in town, because you've seen that this overall architecture is modular. And they had to do this in a modular way in ONAP, because, yeah, there is specific VNF managers that you have to go and integrate against. And I think this shows the value of moving away from this gray big box to something that is colorful, composable, and best of breed. So we can suddenly go and put the pieces that you really want to go use, combine in an open way. So with this, I think ONAP set out, and it's us to support ONAP and make ONAP successful, because we are allowing for best of breed in the orchestration space. In the overall kind of OSS, BSS layer, something that was almost monolithic so far, which hasn't really seen a load of evolution. Why? Because there was no possibility to effectively compete in this space. There was no way to go and position multiple components into one bigger picture, because you always ended up with silos. I think that's something that ONAP breaks apart. We can use it as a reference architecture, and we can obviously use individual building blocks from open source and compose them into a larger system. So if we would like a particular open source component, fine. But I've seen many carriers say, I like the reference architecture. I want something that is commercially supported. So I think both of them are there. And I had a couple of links here uh, for more info. And you can go see me around I'm around all day. If there's any immediate questions, I'm more than happy to take them right now. I have one. Oh. <laughs> When, mm -hmm. right? And Carl sat me very soon. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering, is there any room for Yang and uh, model-driven in this architecture? Somewhere? So ONAP overall is completely model-driven. Um, and I think what I've, I've hidden here very nicely, um, if you're talking and if you're configuring individual network devices, even on the, the simple things that we showcase today, um, the individual elements of, say, virtual CPE use case, all of them are configured using NetConfYang. Why? Because it's a conglomerate of VPP and an agent called Honeycomb built in open source under the FIDO project. So that's already there. Um, you want to go use NSO there, and I think that's one of the key motivations for Curious, because not everybody is Yang, and not everybody is able to speak the Yang flavor of choice that Open Daylight speaks. Um, that's one area. But overall, I think the overall ONAP architecture is very model-driven, and they're setting out to go evolve from workflow into something that is model-driven in the future. Um, I have to say the, the ugly word here, it's mostly Tosca, um, because it's, cus it's, it's operators that believe in that combination of you have an individual of workflow, you have dependencies between these workflows, so those are the edges in your graph. So you're composing things into a, a topology that you ultimately use to describe your end state. So this end state description and the execution capability of a, uh, of a Tosca model is what really, I think, attracts carriers. Um, so the higher layer up, which is also why Area Tosca is there as a combination with Komunda as a workflow engine for SO, um, it's mostly Tosca, but I think Yang and Tosca are not really far away from each other. 
And well, we've even shown translations between the two. The key thing is that it's model driven. It comes to the earlier thing, like the key thing is that the devices can be configured using an API. What API? I don't really care because I can translate these things into each other. But no API or some API, that's a big difference. Good point, thank you. Thank you, anybody? All righty. All right, Hori, hopefully I didn't eat too much time oh, of your... Oh, ah, there is another oh. one. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is about uh, VCB, if I take it as a, a use case. Uh, Dennis O uh, is an <coughs> positioned as an SDN controller or a service uh, orchestrator. Mm -hmm. So can I put the NSO as a service orchestrator to integrate with OSS, PSS? I also uh, maintain redundancy, uh, self-healing, uh, versus provisioning, um, customer database. Is the NSO can do all this, or it's only uh, well, I, I pushing configuration? So you have to go and compare capability set and overall role in the architecture. Um, from a capability set perspective, we can absolutely do that, right? So you can br bring up individual conglomerates of virtual machines that are stitched together into a larger service like virtual CP. That's not the problem. I think what the ONAP people try to address is a combination of future and legacy into one single solution. And that's what you see in if you're decomposing service orchestrator. Because there is a workflow engine, Komunda, for almost classical template-driven provisioning. Um, where you're hardwiring what has to happen. Go here, go that, drive this interface, go configure this thing, uh, do this shell command to this particular device, and then you're a happy bunny. If something changes, oh boy. Um, that's still there. Uh, and they're combining that, or trying to combine this, with a model-driven orchestration tool. They've chosen for ARIA Tosca in this place and bolding this together. Um, if you go in entire model driven only, you're creating a step function. That's people, people trying to avoid that, right? So you have this kind of slow ramp up where you can say, OK, I can do certain things model driven. And in this case here, if you look at SO architecture, it's sometimes the model kick in BPMN, and sometimes it's Komunda pick, uh, kick in Area Tosca. Um, just depends on what your use case are. So if you have an entire model driven use case, easy. If you have to rope in legacy, not so easy. Does that help? That's Frank's way yeah, of saying you. yes. It, th that's Frank's yeah. way of so saying yes, it that's depends. That's Frank's way of saying yes, you can. <laughs> so the answer yes, you is can. yes, but look I think with NSO, we could do all that. The componentry, well, I think for now is slightly different. But the answer is yes, but we need to do a lot of development to be able to form the end-to-end picture? Well, if it's, if it's in isolation, it's not so much development. I think if we want to go and integrate this into an overall picture and be more flexible about this, because what I'm not showing here is what feeds SO. SO is fed by a component called SDC, Service Design and Creation, which is an offline design time component where are creating models with associated business process, uh, and that's been fed that into SO. So I think it depends on how far do you want to go, um, and to what level do you want to go and integrate yourself into the larger picture? But I think it's, it's great for a dinner conversation or a lunch oh, conversation. Okay, thank you. Should and we also stand I still I and do this like this? <laughs> Should I have an easier photo? No? Okay. Um. No, so, and I also think, Frank, it's, it's, uh, I think the, the question you asked it was pretty broad. Maybe not even connected to ONAP. I think it, it was a general question, right? You know, do we connect NSO to, to order managers, for example, as part of an OSS BSS stack? And that's easy, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep, yep. Yep. With a uh, Netcracker orchestrator. Yes. And we do north and south right. integration. Right. And all what I explained is, uh, is something we do today. Yes. Yeah. So my question, can I replace that with the NSO? Yep. That's my main question. Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. We have a project with the Cisco. And the guy's working with us on this, and we hope we can uh, oh. achieve a POC on that. Yeah, we next, absolutely want to go do next that. Next year, you come back and, and have a presentation on, on that outcome. Thank yeah. you. Any other ONAP questions? Well, thank you very much, Frank. Thanks, Carl. Thanks a lot.
All right, we have another half hour. I hope you guys are psyched to spend another 30 minutes with me. We're going to talk about a release plan and roadmap, and then we're actually going to we're going to use the beautiful Menti tool. I keep saying that they are the second coolest Swedish technology company ever. Um, all right, let's dive right into it. So now I'm switching gear to my my product manager hat here. Here's uh, what we're planning to do in the short term, and some of you may have been in the room when we had a CDM presentation. CDM, a three-letter three acronym standing for Common Data Models. Uh, I am going to talk about that a little bit in the, in the, in the roadmap, but in general, um, what we call CDM is the ability for NSO to have several instances of the same Yang namespace loaded into the system at the same time. That was a short sentence. Turns out that this is a pretty interesting engineering challenge um, that we are hard at work solving right now, and that will open up for a whole slew of really, really cool things going forward. The fact of the matter, though, is that in order to do such profound changes in the code base, um, it turns out that you have to touch many, many subsystems. The idea of having namespaces as a unique identifier throughout the system space um, is pervasive with NSO. So you know that if you know the namespace of the module, you can uniquely identify it. With CDM and with the way kind of the world is going right now, that's not going to hold true. So there's going to be a pretty profound impact at, uh, in the core of NSO. So we've been working on this. And what we're going to do is that we're going to use this feature, if you like, this refactoring of one of the profound expectations of NSO as the starting point for our five branch. So we're not going to do the free BSD thing and go to 4.26 or anything like that. Uh, we're actually right now gearing up for an NSO 5. What this does, though, is that it kind of, again, changes some of the profound, you know, some of the fundamental expectations on how NSO works. So we're going to use, you know, except for the fact that most people that are experienced in the industry knows not to take 0.0 releases, we're going to make it a little more explicit. We're actually going to use the 5.0 to 5.1 cycle and spend time with a couple of um, customers that are very close to us, uh, both inside the company and outside the company. So we're going to use the 5.0 to 5.1 um, as a limited availability and really make sure that we hammer the living um, bejesus out of the code base uh, with CDM and also make sure that the one of the di design criteria we've had for CDM is that unless you're actually going to use the feature, you don't, you're not supposed to see it, right? You're not supposed to be forced to do any changes, or at least very, very limited changes. Um, so we're going to also try out and, and really prove that assumption. So we're going to do a five branch, but we're going to keep the four branch alive until we feel that five is ready for mainstream. So we're going to actually spend some time with a synchronized two released train, right? So 4x and 5x will actually be the same feature set except for CDM until we feel CDM is robust, and then we will ramp down um, 4x. The ramping down will, of course, you know, be the same um, follow the same uh, processes that we have in place in terms of end of life, end of service, or anything like that. So it's not a very dramatic change. But we will make sure to tell you when we will start thinking about ramping down feature development on 4x, meaning that's, that's the kind of the product management way of saying, please start planning to go to 5x. OK? Is that clear? Anyone have a question about that? Or is it as clear as I wanted it to be? Yes, that's a mean question. So 5.0 builds are available now internally. 5.0 release or release builds will come in the coming few weeks, maybe months. So I'd say that little overlap here will be up until 4.9. So 4.9 is planned for probably Q2 19. So Q2 calendar 19 is where we will take the first, we will step back and say, do we start ramping down on the 4x now? And 5.1 should be roughly in the same area. So first half next year, late first half next year, is when we're probably going to go back to you guys who have this in production and start talking about how do we make it a smooth transition. That's a good question. Any other awesome questions about this? All right. Good. 
high-level roadmap. So this is, again, you guys. Um, so, <laughs> so roadmaps, right? Roadmaps uh, are, in, 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 in a product management sense, normally used for two, two reasons. You use them to tell people who hasn't really bought the thing yet about how some of the cool features you're developing. And for customers that actually have the thing you have, um, you also talk to them about what you're planning to do to get some priorities. You guys are mostly very seasoned, so I'm actually not going to spend a lot of time on the roadmap, but I want to walk you through what we're thinking and then hit some of the bigger ideas that we have. And here's, well, I'm going to pause a couple of times and ask questions, but this is roughly the timelines that we're seeing. 4.7 is literally hours away, right? So it's, it's, I can hear the crunch of release builds going um, a couple of hundred meters away from here. 4.7 is probably going to be early Q1.19, uh, 4.7x, and then 4.8, like I said, um, you know, mid or, or you know, first half of, of 19. I should say actually Q4.19, so Q4.18 here. Let me, let me fix it. Here we go. Here we go. That's how PLM works. That's how product management works. Ah, that's now, that, now that's true. Cool. 4.7. We've spent quite a bit of time, I hope you've noticed, and I was so happy to see the Cisco IT guys actually using the UI. I hope you've noticed that we've, under a couple of quarters now, really have dug into our UI. It is a long journey, actually, to make a good, useful, and if you ask our UI people, not just a demo UI, but something that's profoundly useful in operations, um, is quite the task. One of the things that's coming out now in 4.7 is a first version of a monitoring dashboard. One of the, let's say, uh, core user types we have is actually people running NSO. They don't actually, may not even know what it's doing, but they are operationally responsible for NSO. They have asked for a like one shot, one view, uh, overview of the operational state of the system. So this is the first version of that. So obvious things like connected devices and types and wh how many services in flight and service instances and what we call service progress monitoring, meaning, and uh, actually I'll talk about that feature uh, I think in the next slide. This is work in motion, right? So you will see a lot of changes in this view over, over the coming releases to make it like a one, one view rapid understanding of how, how NSO is doing and whether it's humming along nicely or no. Someone mentioned Swagger, and so yes, this is the first release uh, of um, Swagger. For those of you who don't know, Swagger is a means of describing, it's a description language for REST APIs. What's cool for us is that, of course, we have a REST interface, or actually we have a RESTConf interface. A RESTConf is a known mapping between Yang-based data sources and REST operations, or HTTP verbs, uh, HTTP operations. So we can reliably take Yang modules and translate them into Swagger or OpenAPI documentations. And this is meant to delight people that actually consume NSO. So it's for our friends over at the order manager or ITSM or other uh, software entities that talk into NSO. And it seems that the main interest from, from uh, people in that uh, domain is, first of all, for documentation. Right? It can be a little daunting to uh, review Yang to understand what the API can do for you. Swagger actually is mostly known for the Swagger UI. So it's a means of actually, um, if you like, navigating a REST API. Now, Yang modules um, and service models, and not, not, not to mention device models, are fairly large. So the Swagger definitions become huge. Um, but it does provide a very nice and navigatable and, and um, test, testable uh, documentation environment. And we also have customers that have pretty sizable um, tooling around Swagger or, or open, open API, which means that they take Swagger definitions and they actually, for example, generate libraries in their, in their favorite programming language, or for that matter, feeds it into um, order managers or other types of, of interaction systems um, like ServiceNow and others, right? So it's, it's a well-known IT uh, modeling language. And again, it's a, it's a reliable one-to-one -one mapping between Yang and Swagger, so except for the fact that uh, we had to work a little bit on understanding how to translate the type systems, it was a pretty straightforward, uh, pretty straightforward experience. 
And what Jonas mentioned here uh, was that, uh, right, was that um, um, what we won't do in this release is we won't integrate this into our web server. It will be a one-step tooling thing on the side, right? Thinking about how that would, what that would look like. We could obviously uh, on the fly generate actually the swagger, but right now it's going to be a, a compiler step or actually a step using uh, the um, Yanger tool. Okay, so act actually, let me ask this. Who here would have immediate use of Swagger? Ah, known entity, that's new, that's new. A couple. Service progress monitoring. All right, so especially in the virtual domain, uh, we have customers that have operational challenges in the time domain, right? You guys know that, especially when you use the reactive fast map development patterns with NSO, we can actually go and ask external systems to do things for us and then wait for a response. That asynchronous nature of the service creates an interesting administrative task, which is to say how long to wait until I should actually tell a human that something is going wrong. Before this feature, the only way to do this would be to poll for these things, right? To actually have an outside timer to say, well, this service instance has been hanging in this part of the plan in this reactive fast map um, application for a long time. So what we've done is that we've added as a, uh, as a primary feature, as a configurable feature, uh, expressions to describe how much wall clock time do I wait uh, for things to happen in this plan until I uh, actually mark it as jeopardized and how much further until I actually uh, uh, mark it as violated. So if you like, it's a code-free way of adding time domain monitoring to reactive fast map or asynchronous services. For most people using NSO, this comes into play with our NFV orchestrator. The NFV orchestrator is a very heavy user of this asynchronous behavior, and it's also uh, something that relies quite heavily on uh, a piece of the industry infrastructure that has, doesn't have the best uh, uh, reliability, that's OpenStack. So we have had many environments where the OpenStack has been a little shifty, and uh, NSO gets stuck waiting for OpenStack to do things for it. Before this, again, there were no alarms raised. With this, we can actually put time constraints on the wait time. 471. This is uh, a feature that comes mostly from our uh, highly uh, regula regulatory um, defined uh, environments usually na nationwide service providers and banks. Um, as much as they may like our logs, they also want to see the payload. So they have a requirement to actually get all the payloads generated by NSO onto stable storage. So it's a means for us to just open up in certain control points and make sure we dump out the data generated by NSO such that it can be taken uh, into offline storage. Um, so think about things like the dry run content, think about think li things like sync from content, or things that our customers would like to have actually uh, stored and, uh, to the side. And yeah, not, not to forget, importantly also, um, all the content, all those payloads needs to be related to an authenticated entity. So who is doing this, right? Who's doing it and what was the result? 4.8. This one is, is a pretty big one. We're still um, scratching our heads in excitement on how this uh, will look like, and, and, and more importantly, how will this be used? It's one of these, almost like an engineering feature. It makes so much sense that you have to do it, but when you start doing it, you're thinking, how is this actually going to be used, right? So now we have um, a growing base of relatively well-working NetConf and Yang implementations in the industry. We've also been, as you guys know, um, actively pushing for it and act actively also contributing technologies like for those of you who know what ConfD is. So, so we're kind of there. There's several vendors that have a reasonably well-behaved NetConf and Yang uh, implementation on the device layer. Now, a pretty obvious next step then for NSO is to make sure that we leverage both the RESTConf but it definitely initially um, NetConf to fetch, inline fetch the Yang from the devices and if you like, generate the nets. So what you do is that you can point NSO to an, an endpoint with some credentials and tell it, please 
build me a NED, right, for this particular device. And we will fetch uh, the, the, the Yang and build in the background uh, a NED and load it into the system. So if you keep going th down that path or through that trajectory, you will also, of course, realize that the whole idea of a NED eventually will kind of fade, right? It has more to do with extracting the contract from the device and make sure that that contract is expressed in your abstraction. There's, a, there's some ways to go here. And again, what we're trying to figure out here is a comfortable and useful way of building around this concept. So it's engineering level, pretty obvious that we should do this. What's a little more head scratching is exactly how do we believe that engineers are going to use this and how do we build the tooling, uh, the tooling for it. For those of you who have spent uh, a lot of time with NSO and, and maybe even been part of the uh, interoperability um, events that we go to know that there's actually an external package called Pioneer that actually does this today. So fundamentally for us, it's about taking the ideas of the Pioneer package and making it a first-class citizen in, uh, in NSO. NetConf and RESTConf call home. <laughs> I, I was gonna, either he's going to say it or I'm going to call him out. Christian's favorite feature. Um, we have struggled in the industry uh, for a long time, uh, coming up with a secure and standardized way, in that order, of allowing um, newly started or booted devices to make themselves known to a managing entity. It hasn't been a big problem. It hasn't been a big problem enough that there has been a, like a, a coherent response from the standards community in the physical world. Now, if you think about the frequency and the complexity of change. Um, in assets over time in a virtualized world, meaning you're going to spin up and, and turn down VNFs uh, in a frequency that, of course, is orders of magnitude more than in the physical world, you'll see that this is going to become very important. And that's when you realize that there's a big security challenge here, too. So actually, as, as these things go, in the background in the ITF, we, we've been working with the security uh, directorate for several years now to come up with a secure and trusted way of actually allowing newly booted devices to make themselves known. And it's documented in RFC 8071, um, and it allows the NetConf or RESTConf servers, right? Because remember, the devices are traditionally the servers, to reliably find and call home to, let's call it an orchestrator, right? And there was a, a number of hoops we had to jump through. It's built on SSH. So we had to implement a little bit of a, what's called a role reversal feature in SSH, so the client can become the server and the other way around. And that took us both across the trust boundary, because it seems like most operational people actually trust SSH, and we can leverage all the nice um, um, keying and all that kind of thing that exists in, in, uh, in SSH. And it, hope it also actually supports both the, the natted and direct scenarios. So it's, it's a type of feature that has been seen from many vendors. What's really exciting to us, of course, being a multi-vendor solution, is that it seems that this has great op it's a great opportunity actually to build one single set of um, protocol extensions that will actually work across vendors. And the good thing for us, too, is that we have both NSO and ConfD, and we can introduce this both on the client and the server side at the same time. So we can actually impact um, the vendor base um, at the same time as we implement this in our orchestrator. Multiple namespaces. Yeah, I kind of I kind of talked through this. Again, the kind of killer for us was when we realized that there's already now in some of the networks that our customers have um, vendors that implement the same module, but it turns out that the content between them is actually different. So they're kind of violating the uniqueness of namespaces by having different content uh, in, the, in, in what's supposed to be the same Yang module across vendors, for example. And this is actually then, for, th for, for the current generation uh, NSO, it's actually a showstopper. You know, we, we literally can't have two Yang modules with the same namespace loaded in at the same time. I believe actually the most recently loaded will be the one, right? So it's become a pressing matter from an operational sense for several of our customers. Um, but the actual implementation of a solution to this is also then opens up for a whole lot of really cool um, features going forward, like allowing someone to have multiple versions of the same NED loaded in, makes us open up for, for example, um, online analytics of the impact of moving your service from one version uh, to another version of a vendor, for example. So we can actually do formal analysis of, of the impact of that. 
So it's, a, it's, it's both, let's say, a catch up with the uh, brownfield networks of today, but it also opens up for a lot of cool features going um, to come out in the future. I'll skip this. OK, so that was the roadmap. That's the high-level roadmap. So now, is it my intense pleasure is to ask, what's missing from this roadmap? Please, big-ticket items. I'll take all of the small ones on the side. Are there any big-ticket items that we should be doing? Here we go. Rather a question for my colleague who's currently not there. Uh, so, a uh, question is about uh, network topology discovery. Are there any plans to figure out what devices are available in the network, how they interconnect, and all that from an SO perspective? So, it can be done somewhat automatically. Good one. So, I, I'd say that the next thing after secure call home that the industry has to solve is that right now, if you look at the commercial offerings for network topology discovery, what they are are terrible hacks of ping sweeps and MIB inquiries, right? So we have one of those, and it's as terrible as the rest of the industry, right? So for now, that's about the level that we're, we're at, right? And it's also particular terrible features related to which, which layer you're talking about. And I actually, I would love to have, a, you know, uh, 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 maybe a beer-fueled conversation about how we could solve that as an industry. But right now, NSO doesn't have anything in the pipeline that would cut to the heart of the problem. Uh, in this domain, for now, we're going to be as horrible as, as everybody else. Uh, so, slight follow-up to that one. Uh, is there a difference between network topology discovery and network device discovery? Because the answer you had, Carl, sounded sort of like network device discovery, pinging, finding devices. But I don't know, at least my interpretation of the original question was actually about discovering the topology. Maybe you already have the devices and you just want the topology, like you know, LLDP and ISIs adjacencies and so forth, to form layer two, layer three, and so forth, uh, topology. Maybe it's something to think of over that beer. Yeah, or yeah. Five. no, you're, you're right, you're right. So the ping sweep unveils managed entities, and then you have to query them for their relationship to, the, to, the, to each other in different layers. So you're right, you're right. They should probably be looked at as two distinct different problems to solve. Agreed. It's a free-for-all. Any other features you want on, on the roadmap? Yeah, I guess following on from what you were saying about the multiple NED versions being in, that you could then do analysis and say, what happens if we go from this version to this version? So take that back a step. If we make new packages, take a new version of the core function pack, what we really struggle with so far is the core function pack team make a change, deprecate something for maybe a good reason, but we find that out at a package reload time. And anything that we could do to be able to say, what would happen if we did a request packages reload with this set of packages that are our target which we want to use and speed up that testing dry run and being able to do it with scrapes of data rather than doing it in a, we've, like the guy was saying yesterday, we've got test environments with synthetic test cases. They're easier to get to pass than the real data. So that's a real pinch point for us. We get to package reload and then, ah, something <laughs> went wrong. Yes. Now you are dragging our cool cats out of the future bag. You're bang on target. You are absolutely bang on target. The ability to, to do analysis also on the services layer, actually following the referential integrity between the service layer and the device layer um, with multiple versions of the same service package is, is exactly where we want to go. That's exactly where we want to go. So if you think about it, it's, it's like a model lifecycle dry run. So it's not a dry run on the instance data, it's actually dry runs on the service models themselves, combined with the, with the instance data. So that's, yep. e that's exactly where we want to go. Yep, thank you. I have another question. Uh, it's about performance. So I'll first make a statement that we're sort of having difficulties with performance, uh, uh, both just in 
sort of role performance as well as in concurrency, which half of this is probably a, a design, a known design of NSO. Um, I'll also steal the crowd. I don't know if there are anyone else in here that are entirely happy with the performance of NSO. Or Who, who's others. not entirely happy about the performance of NSO? Up. Good. 20. 15. Yep. You're, that's, so you're right. Right. What are you doing about it? Yeah. So, OK. So it's, it's one of those things that's really hard to capture um, on the roadmap. So we're doing not a few big things, but many small things, I think, is, is the most fair assumption. And of course, one of the things, one of the more interesting engineering challenges that we have is um, to think, so the, one of the cool things, or things that people are in love with in terms of, of NSO, is the transactionality, meaning that it's a synchronous means of interacting with your network. But at the same time, most uh, uh, customers, when they come to wide-scale deployment, realize that that comes with a, with a well-known kind of computer science level cost, right? Means that there is a serialization of the, I, I, nowadays I call it point-in-time concurrency or, or point-in-time synchronicity, right? At, at for every operation you do towards the network, you need to be momentarily um, coherent, momentarily in sync across the database. And you need to be that because Yang can express pretty complicated and powerful expressions on what needs to be true. And that is actually at the core of this challenge. This is, if you like, in the way of true concurrency, right? Because you can't really be truly concurrent with operations unless you can prove to yourself or have a human sign off on that the operations will not violate each other's isolation. So that, that's at the core of the challenge. And we've done LSA and commit queues to kind of to try and get away from the single system-wide lock for it, and also to reduce the amount of time we need to spend on that point-in-time coherence. Um, and we are exploring a couple of other directions um, to do this. For example, again, you could think of profiling your service Yang to ensure that certain operations on certain service models could actually be concurrent. Because truthfully, it's not really a limitation in NSO's implementation. We would be more than happy to take any suggestion on how to make everything perfectly concurrent. It is more of an architecture. How do we keep the transactionality and the synchronous nature of the northbound interfaces that people seem to gravitate towards and make it more scalable, both in the time domain, faster, but also in the, in the, in the, in the number of outstanding operations. So there you go for, with a PLM answer. So we're doing a lot of things, but they're mostly small, trying to get around this while maintaining what we believe to be one of the core value propositions of NSO. Thank you. Yes, Victor? OK. So, um, reminded me that you know, in terms of LSO, LSA, and commit queues, please make it more explicitly um, documented on how you go about that to address these kinds of concerns. I mean, when you're uh, starting to use an LSA deployment, you're sort of breaking some of the uh, promises that you're talking about. So it's, I, I mean, I think it's sort of um, funny or sad uh, that, that you have to move to multiple NSO deployment uh, you know, it's called LSA, right? It breaks those promises, but we could just as well break those promises with a single NSO instance and gain higher concurrency. I mean, you have many CPUs in a modern computer, uh, so we could use a lot of those instead of having it sort of single-threaded uh, for a lot of the time, right? But that is one aspect of it, and I did mention concurrency, but there is also, I think, a lot of performance improvements that needs to be done just overall, even regardless of what sort of operation, how many you are doing in parallel, uh, it, it can simply be faster. But I, I guess we'll uh, elaborate on this separately. Good. With uh, the implementation of multiple nets, as you mentioned, is it then also possible to have nets controlling uh, devices with uh, an IP subnet and other devices having the same IP subnet, you know, handling o IP overlap, which is in our use case quite common? Hmm. <laughs> I don't think that the CDM feature will help with that. Okay. I don't see how that will help. But maybe that's an offline conversation. Okay. Yeah. Ah. Yeah. 
so just returning to uh, Christian's point here. Um, so we, we had a lot of performance problems with NSO, but we, we solved a lot of them. But it's, um, it's like, for instance, if you have like very long lists, the NSO and the JVM would sort of play ping pong. Yep. Um, and then you, you make a ticket about it, and then here are the secret commands where you can build a list inside of it, and then you can send it all to NSO in one go. It's like, it should not be difficult to do the performant thing. Right. That should be the, the, the default. Um, and then on the other side, when you have to collect like operational data, do a lot of self-status, this tends to go in like a sequential order, even though there's like 30, 40 devices in it, so there's no reason this could not be done in parallel. Um, and there's no downside to be able to do this. So this like being able to do operations in parallel sometimes is... No, you're absolutely yeah. right. And this is what I'm referring to when I'm saying, I think it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a couple of tens of those that will make the biggest impact over time rather than a one big honking um, feature to solve it all. So you're, you're right on both your examples. Do you, have, um, do you have any plans to support RESTConf natively on NSO? There you go. Do you mean the northbound interface or the southbound interface? Are you talking so to RESTConf? Southbound. Yes, yes. It is on, it's on just outside of the roadmap. And what we're doing right now is thinking about how. So well, if I back out a little bit, and uh, I, will, I will say that we're not particularly in love with the idea of using REST or RESTCOM for that matter in the distributed domain for obvious reasons, right? REST is not supposed to have side effects, i.e. you can't actually use it for transactional interaction. On the other hand, we know that there's a slew of vendors, both controllers that we're asked to be con controlling, but also devices that have RESTCOM. So, you know, forget about engineering purity. We will absolutely do that, you know, uh, based on, on customer demand. And there are, again, there's, for example, a, a known controller in the optical domain that seems to go very hard on RESTCOM. So that will probably be the first one. And the experience from that will build into the tooling around actually building NEDs uh, more automatically, probably internally first. And then, like we do with the, with the NETCONF NED builder, make that part of the tool chain. So yes. Let me add a comment to that. So if, you, if we enable that, those devices that have RESTCONF northbound interfaces will never work as well as those that have NETCONF. Just right. The protocol doesn't have the same functionality. All right. Oh, sorry, was there a follow-up? Yeah, was something. Yeah. The reason we want net RESTCONF is because the vendors that are providing that right. don't need the requirements of NETCONF. So we, we we're using the capabilities of RESTConf to deliver what we require on the, yeah. uh, from those vendors. Yeah. But one of the things that RESTConf lacks, for example, is network-wide transactions. So there will not be these atomic transactions when you have net RESTConf devices in there. But you know, we can leave it there. Yeah. All right, cool. So I'm just going to wrap up here and talk about two bigger areas um, of thinking that we have. And then we're going to do a, a brief menti, and then it's lunch. Um, and this one is more to start you guys thinking and hopefully... Oh, one more. question. Uh, yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, <laughs> regarding commit queues on LSA, uh, will we have error recovery with reactive FastMap? Ooh. Anyone from engineering wants to take that? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Care uh, to expand on the, on, on the no? <laughs> Who said no? Thomas, was that you? I can make a comment. I mean, <laughs> it's a long answer, so let's, let's not do it right here now. <laughs> so w you guys are leaving us with a no. OK. 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 Can you repeat? Yeah, so real brief, redeploy, which is at the heart uh, of reactive fast map, um, doesn't actually have a, say that one more time. Can, right, it's that transactional intent, right? So the reversal is not as straightforward, or it doesn't, it's not part of the uh, redeploy. And I would, yeah. We, in I, I would say, let's, let's not do it here. But it's right. a long and complicated <laughs> answer. It's a yeah. deep discussion. Uh, okay. 
we will take that offline and you know over uh, lunch or coffee for anyone who wants to join. <laughs> yes. Different question. One more mic. I think we soon need to break for, for yeah, lunch. I know. So we're gonna do yeah. the menti first or before we're breaking? Yes, let's do yeah. the menti. But let's so okay, last last question. Last question. Though, yeah. Real uh, brief next steps and then menti. One of the things we the OSSB system wants from us is modif or verification of modification in an LSA system. Um, do you have plans to implement some kind of functionality that, that sends northbound notifications about finished commit queue items? Because we can have like 15 minute queue of items when we do really, really big things and the customer or the system above us won't know when it's actually done unless we ourselves write some kind of implementation. So LSA, commit queues, and the northbound client needs a notification when the queue items have been actually executed. Anyone from engineering? That is no big deal to fix. And uh, with CDM support, you can actually get access to that queue item directly. So, it, it so yes. the future is bright. <laughs> so yes, OK. All righty. OK, so speeding up a little bit, just to leave you with two of the, the bigger picture uh, discussions we're having internally. Number one, um, really interesting development recently with customers that have very large sets of data in CDB, is that we've seen them start hooking CDB content into all kinds of analytic systems, right? Both actually online or offline. So one of the bigger things we're thinking about is how do we make NSO a useful data source um, for all kinds of BI or other static, um, or for that matter, dynamic. I'm not going to say uh, machine learning, but I just did. Um, how do we make it a more reliable and useful and comfortable data source for offline analysis of what we have here? That's a, that's a very big thing for many of our customers that are now realizing that the configuration data that we carry for the tens of thousands of devices that they have is probably something that they should pay more attention to. Number two, and actually this is part of the Menti, we're starting to see, and we've asked intensively over the years, you know, what do you guys think about having other deployment models, other delivery models of NSO? For the first time, I've had people not just shooting me down right away a couple of months ago and saying it would be, normally the response is there's no way we can ever think of a future where we would have something like NSO actually hosted off-prem in a public cloud. So this is another thing we're thinking about, is how, what would that look like? How would this actually play into the operational reality of our customer base? Third one, a lot of customers use us for critical infrastructure. We're getting hammered both from the northbound, the operational interfaces, and southbound from the virtual, uh, uh, if you like, the virtual domain with um, asynchronous signals. Hitless upgrades of not only the core NSO, but the actual function packs and the NEDs. Um, that can actually still perform the core uh, features of an orchestrator. Again, not only taking orders from the northbound, but also listening to the network. That's another big thing we're thinking about. OK, with that, we're going to hit the menti. Ha! Huh. Right, here goes. So guys and girls, would it help <coughs> if we actually gave you uh, off-prem cloud-hosted instance of NSO. Think of it NSO as a service. You would log into a portal, you would gain your isolated instance to manage your virtual and physical network. That's what I'm telling you, the yes uh, thing here is going. I think 100, right? We stop at 100. But it's nice and even. That's very interesting. 95. <laughs> Here we go. Yay. <laughs> Come on. OK. Ah, there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Yep, moving on to next. Here, OK, so, so it's hard to be brief. Like, here's what I'm super curious about. Do you today? deploy services not by a human interacting with NSO, but some kind of software calling into NSO. So no humans in the actual service 
operations, so the orders of services. That's cool. Huh? Yes. But it's not mutually exclusive. So I do know that there are customers that just does create services, not update, but they count. Off to a good start. Very good, very good. So half and half. That's interesting. Okay, next one. Okay, this is a good one, right? <laughs> you guys have already started. What level of out-of-band changes uh, happens in your network despite the fact that NSO actually manages partially or fully the network? How good are you at keeping those pesky humans out of NSO's way? I like the, the yellow team. Go yellow team. <laughs> Oh, but all the time, the blue team is really coming out strong here. The saddest menti today. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> Boo. Cool. Okay, next one. Okay, so we, we understand that there's no free text fields here. So apologies for constraining the options. What can we do for you to increase the NSO adoption uh, in your network? Otherwise, people ju will just type Boaty McBoatface into the form. Cool. Interesting. Victor, your team is catching up, the documentation team. Cool. More pre-built use cases it is. Want to move to the next? Ah, this is for me, right? Because I do get to talk to all the other vendors and all the other systems. Which of these systems would you like NSO to integrate more with? You guys know that it's a platform, so I'm sure with the magic that you have, you can make it integrated into whatever. What would you like us to lower the barrier of integration around? Ansible team, probably inspired by what I said before. <coughs> nice illustration of the cloud world here, going. Cool. Good that we have the one, the number one out on top, well covered or initially covered. Okay, there's one more, right? Ah, right, so in your daily work, what kind of usability improvements do you think would have the most impact? This is gonna go straight to Victor after this. We'll guide his work. A very honest and technical crowd, documentation and tooling. Is this the last one, or is there one more? Okay. And what a popular topic. Cool. Is it, this the one more? Nope. All right. Thank you very, very much. And again, catch me in the halls. I'm here until you guys leave. So anything you want to talk about around this or anything to do with the uh, product management side of things, catch me in the hall. Thanks, everybody.